Okay, uh, it's six o'clock. We shall start the session now. So I hope you guys can hear me. Okay, if not, yeah. Okay, great. So uh, hello and welcome everybody. I'm Sylvia from ACC Singapore. And with me tonight are our speakers, uh, Yuet Lai, uh, Miss Li Yuet Lai, lecturer from Kaplan. Uh, Miss Yvonne Go, lecturer from LSBF Singapore, and Esther, our regional head of uh, education for ASEAN ANZ uh, in ACCA. So I hope that uh, all of you are well prepped for the September exams because uh, exams are just around the corner. Uh, and of course, tonight's session with our tutors will definitely benefit you further for your upcoming advanced taxation exam. Okay, so uh, following that, you will also be getting uh, first-hand news on the introduction of the strategic professional exams from Esther. And of course, for tonight's session, we would like to thank our Platinum Approved Learning Partners, Kaplan and LSBF Singapore, for supporting this ACCA Regional Students Virtual Conference. And also a big thank you to our tutors, Yvonne and Yuet Lai, for your time tonight. Okay, so lastly, before we start, I would like to remind you to please put all your questions under the Q&A tab on the Zoom platform. Okay, and we will be addressing all the questions during the Q&A segment because uh, we don't have a lot of time and we have a lot to cover. So in the interest of time, we will stick to these arrangements. All right, so without further ado, I shall hand the time over to Esther to start off the next segment. Thank you. Um, right, I think I can see my slides on the screen. Okay, so um, my topic here is to give you an update on what is coming up in Strategic Professional um, in March 2021. So now, okay, for the September exam, um, your ATEX exam will be paper-based, as you all know. Um, however, moving to March 2021, um, Singapore, except for ATX Singapore variant, will be moving to computer-based exam for the strategic professional. Now, once we move into computer-based exam, um, the paper-based exam will be removed. Okay, so unlike in applied skills where there's a parallel run, for strategic professional, you will be a convert straight to computer-based exam. Now, for this session where you are doing your ATX exam, then your computer-based exam for ATX will only commence in June next year. Hi Esther, okay. sorry, you are, you're not on the slideshow mode. It's on the notes mode. Oh, hmm. I was, okay, let me just uh, come on again. Is this slideshow now? Uh, still on the notes mode. But we can see your slide along with the notes. Oh, I know yeah. now. Oh, uh, um, okay, or maybe you want to keep it at this way. Oh, then hang on. The, I, the slide will look bigger. Okay. I will just... Uh, give me a second to maybe um, stop sharing first, then I think I can reshare using slideshow. Is this the slideshow mode now, Sylvia? Uh, no, still, still the one with the mm. notes. Okay, maybe so you want I... to exit this mode because, um, yeah, okay, when so it's this I way, just... right, mm, yep. the, the slide looks bigger. So this is actually better. Yep. Right, okay. I think I'll do it this way then. Okay. Sorry about that. Right. Um, so I think um, for ATX, you don't have to worry because when we change to computer-based exam, uh, there is a lot of support resources that we make available to you. Uh, we started this computer-based exam journey for all our strategic professional level 
in March 2020. So as of now, we've developed quite a lot of support resources. So in the ACCA website, you know there's a page on study support resources. So if you scroll a little bit down um, for your ATX study support resources, there's a section called learning and revision. And that's where we put all the CBE resources um, there for you to have a look. Um, so let me just show you one very quickly, which is on the CB preparation. Okay. So on the CB preparation video for ATX, there are all in four video um, that shows you okay, what you need to be aware of before you go into the exam room and what is the things you should be doing when the exam start, how to plan your answer and how to complete your answer. So I'll come back and play one of these videos, which I think will be very helpful uh, for you to get a quick understanding of you know how to um, prepare yourself for computer-based exam. Um, at the same time, okay, um, there's also another video here which is on YouTube that talks about how to manage your CB workspace effectively. So in the strategic professional level, um, like the paper-based exam, you'll be given a series of exhibits. So how do you match your exhibit and your requirement? so that you can maximize your time on the exam itself, on preparing your answers. Okay. Now, then besides this YouTube video that we have and the CV preparation videos okay, for your use, okay, um, for those students who are doing the up and coming exam, there is also a series of webinar to support them for the individual papers. Okay, so if I'm interested, you can also go in and register and view it as on demand um, later. Okay, the video will be available there for actually quite a long time. Yeah, and this is really new. Okay, I actually only just received this today. Um, oops. Okay, um, which is that we are having a one pager showing you the various CBE support available to you as a student. I think I made a mistake by copying. Uh, an extra picture here. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Right. So having said that, now let me then go on and play this video for you of planning your exam. And what I'd like to highlight to you is that um, in the applied skills, when you are doing your paper um, on the computer, you will realize that you cannot copy the, the question or the requirement okay, to the workspace okay, for you to uh, use those uh, wordings or, or or the requirement. However, in the strategic professional plat uh, exam platform, you can copy out. Okay? So I think I want to highlight this to you okay, because that, that might be quite useful in how you uh, prepare your answers okay, for your ATX exam. Okay, so let me go to the website to show you this particular video. It's a very short one. Each video is only about um, four minutes long. So it's really worth your while to go in to have a look. So there's the one planning your answers. This video explains the steps you could take when planning your answers to the questions following your initial review of the exam. We'll focus on one question as the steps we're going to explain generally apply to all of them. So to start, whichever question you're doing, begin by reviewing the first few sentences on the right hand side of the screen to get a feel for the question context. Once you've done that, the next step is to open the requirements for the question. With the requirements open, now also open the word processor, which you can find under the response options. 
The reason for this is that you're going to copy the requirements into the word processor in order to begin your analysis and lay out the structure of your answer. Note that the various windows in the exam environment can be moved around and resized, and now is a good time to arrange your screen to make it easier to use. We'll put the requirements on the left and the word processor on the right. Obviously, you can lay the screen out in whichever way works best for you, but either way, it's important that you don't cover up the top or bottom toolbars. If you close the word processor, the window is only minimised. You don't need to worry that you're losing any work. Now copy all the requirement text into the word processor. Note the professional marks requirement and mark allocation in this question. When you do copy the requirement across, watch out for the formatting and reformat the text if you need to. This may require you to separate out the sub-requirements to make them clearer for reading. Doing this also sets out your answer structure. In ATX, be aware that you may be directed to an exhibit for more details, such as in Part B, which refers you to the email from your manager. We return to this when we analyse the exhibits further. You can prepare your final answers underneath each sub-requirement, keeping in mind the need for appropriate subheadings to make your answer easier to read and mark. Next, we recommend you go on to analyse each requirement in detail. This is in order to identify the specific actions the examiner expects you to carry out in your response. You can start by adding emphasis to key words by making them bold. We recommend you do this to the verbs and any calculation requirements, as well as the word AND. This exercise ensures that you capture every element that's required in your final answer. Here we're only bolding keywords in Part A, however you should repeat this for the whole question. The next step is to analyse the exhibits to obtain more specific requirement details, but also to start planning your answers. So close the requirements window in order to take a look at the exhibits. Let's do this for part B in this question. Open the email from your manager and read it carefully and actively. You can use a range of techniques at this stage. You may wish to highlight important information or copying and pasting information into the word processor, such as any additional instructions, required calculations, or planning points for your final answer. One of the advantages of a computer-based exam is that you can use the functional tools to help you analyse and answer questions effectively and efficiently. Remember that there are professional marks available in this question. The requirement asks you to prepare a memo, so using the appropriate presentation format and style will help you gain these. You may wish to add more subheadings as required to further break down your answer plan. When you move on to section B, you can follow a similar planning process to the one we've outlined here for section A. Okay, so I hope I have, you know, increased your interest to look at the computer-based uh, platform uh, for ATX, but please do it only after your September exam, because remember, your September exam for ATX is still paper-based. So I end my presentation here, and we'll hand over the time to Yvonne. Over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Esther. So give me a minute now. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, 
All right, so welcome to everyone and welcome everybody to this uh, ACCA Regional Student Virtual Conference. So this is AT at Singapore Variant Paper. So I'm Yvonne here from LSBF Singapore. So I'm here to share a little bit more about ATX to help you in your preparation of your coming examination. So this will be the scope of what I'm going to talk about in this limited 20 minutes time okay so first of all i'm going to go through very quickly on the atx examination format then i'll talk about a little bit more about how do you understand the requirement what is expected of you when you read the requirement in atx examination question then of course i will talk a little bit about your possible atx questions as well as some of the potential areas for ATX when you look into the question, what are the potential areas that we can be looking at. And of course, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more into the groups and individual with an illustration, very simple illustration. Okay, so now let's get started. First of all, examination format. So when it comes to the exam format, okay, exam format is a three hours, 15 minutes paper and 15 marks to pass. I think everyone knows that. So section A, there are two compulsory questions, 35 and 25 marks. So please take note that in section A itself, it's going to be straight away a 60 marks, or 60% like of your whole exam. So section A, we always remember is basically to pass. Just do two questions, you can pass the exam. Then section B, the balance two question is basically just to help you to score. Okay, so remember as well, out of the 15 marks past mark for your examination, there's always four marks professional marks there. So please make sure that you know what to expect out of the professional marks or four marks there, basically your format. And in the last couple of settings, the format for the professional marks has always been a letter format. So make sure that you guys are familiar with the way the format is to be presented in your coming examination. Okay, then next area will be understanding requirement. Many a times when students read the requirement, they are just wondering, so what exactly am I okay supposed to write in the exam in the exam answer itself by looking at the requirement? So you need to first of all understand what are the kind of requirement that you can always be expecting in any examination or in any question itself. It doesn't matter question one, two, three, or four. It doesn't really matter. So basically, this is a text paper. So be prepared that the question is always asking you for text implication. Okay, they always like to use the word text implication. So how many types of text implication can you be looking out for? So if you have really done your revision itself, you've gone through the whole course, you probably know that generally there are four kinds of text implication. Generally, these are the four major types. Income tax implication, withholding tax implication, GST tax implication, and your stamp duty tax implication. So basically, these are the four types, okay? However, what you need to probably be a little bit more aware of is also the fact that sometimes some of the requirement, when you read the requirement, they will be very, very precise. They will actually tell you, okay, all right, state or explain the income tax implication. So they're very precise. They want income tax. So you just tell me income tax will do. Sometimes they will tell you GST. So you only need to tell me about GST, that will be fine. But there are always some requirements whereby they will actually tell you, Okay, explain the tax implication. They just use the word tax implication. So what is expected of you if you just see tax implication? Are you supposed to mention all four? Yes, where relevant. Where relevant. You're expected to state down whatever implications that you can think of pertaining to income tax, withholding tax, GSC, and stamp duty. So long as it is applicable to your case study. Always remember that. Okay, so now let's zoom in into a little bit more details. If I were to see income tax implication, what is it that I need to make sure that I have in, or, or in order to make sure that I score my marks? What to include in your answer? When you see income tax, always remember there's only two things. Okay, two things. What are the two things? If you look at a case study, the question itself, if you see an item that say income, then please make sure that you know that you talk about the taxability. Mention about whether is it taxable, is it not taxable. Then on the other hand, if you see an item of expenditure, that's where you need to consider the deductibility. Is it deductible or non-deductible? In the event it is non-deductible, for example, if it is going to be things like capital expenditure, then you will have to go on further to look into whether are you able to claim any allowances. Okay? Then when we talk about withholding tax, 
So when it comes to withholding tax, always remember that withholding tax always involves two parties. I always like to think along the line that fact that there are two parties. So one party is a person in Singapore who is making the payment to another party outside Singapore. Okay, so the person outside Singapore is usually what we call the non-resident. So there's always a Singapore payer. I like to call it a Singapore payer, the person who pay, and the other party is the one who received that person will be a non-resident. So when you need to talk about withholding tax, always remember you need to mention that you are making payment to someone who is outside Singapore, non-resident. Then you have to establish whether the income is a source in Singapore, and if it is sourced in Singapore, what would be the withholding tax percentage? So remember, withholding tax percentages are not given to you. You need to memorize that. But don't worry, generally there's only just a few, 10%, 15%, if not the 17%. Okay, then next thing is, if I say I'm the Singapore payer here and I'm going to withhold tax, when we talk about withholding tax, always remember that you hold back to your taxes itself, you don't keep in your pocket. Always remember you're supposed to pay over to IRS, so you need to know the deadline as well as a penalty if you fail to do so. So these are the things that you need to include in your answer when they ask for withholding tax. Okay, next thing, when you see GST implication, goods and services tax, Always remember, GST is a transaction tax. So as a result of that, if you want to talk about GST, first of all, you need to look into the question itself and find out what is the transaction first. So when you see what is the transaction already, you will know in the very first place, are you the one who is making the supply or are you the one who is receiving a supply? So if you are looking at the perspective where you're making a supply, we need to ask, so do you need to charge GST? If you're the one who received the supply, that means to say the other party called the supplier is going to charge you GST, then you'll be considering, can I claim the GST, which means to say, can I claim the input tax? So when we usually talk about GST, always remember we are really looking at charging and claiming. Okay, then finally we are looking at stamp duty. So when it comes to stamp duty, always remember you may have buying, or selling portion. So when you buy, consider there's two categories. You okay? get your buyer stamp duty, your additional buyer stamp duty. So when will all this be applicable? Then at the same time, if you're talking about selling, so when you sell, will there be any seller stamp duty involved? So basically, that will be the stamp duty. However, in recent years itself, you realize that there's this ACD, additional conveyance duty. This is a situation whereby you say, okay, I'm going to buy or I am actually the seller. Then I need to consider whether will ACD be applicable. So this will be the issues that we need to consider when they ask for stamp duty implication. Are you all there now? So now you think about it. If I really see a requirement in the upcoming examination and they didn't indicate income tax, withholding tax, GSC or stamp duty, they just say tax implication. What do I need to include? Basically everything in that. Are you all there now? Can I? But of course, don't all right, apply everything when it's not applicable. Always remember, you have to go back okay, to the requirement and of course, go back to the question to see what is the kind of information that is provided before you decide whether would that be taxable, deductible, would that be withholding tax, would that be GSC, would that be stamp duty? Are you all there now? Can I? So that will be the second segment that I have here pertaining to the requirement. So when you read the requirement, you must know what you need to have in your answer. Okay, next thing will be ATX. Usually for ATX, the syllabus to a lot of students, it is actually very broad based. Okay, so what kind of possible question can appear in your examination? For me personally, this is really very personal in my opinion. Okay, I will say that the positive, possible type of questions that we have will be this four category. Anti-avoidance question, groups question, cross-border question, and individual question. Okay, but then of course over here, we have limited time. Therefore, I will not be able to really go through every single area over here. I will only be zooming in only to the two categories, groups and individuals. So when we talk about groups and individuals, so what kind of topics will evolve around group question? What kind of topics will evolve around your individual question? So we say potential topics or areas, whatever you want to call that, relating to groups question. 
okay? So first of all, you need to understand. When you are in examination, you see your, your paper, your examination question paper, you have to read the whole case study. When you read the whole case study, you will be provided with a lot of information, many different kinds of information. So you need to understand when I read certain information, if you should automatically think about, okay, when I see this information, it will trigger me, trigger my mind to think about specific areas or the topic within the syllables that you have learned, okay? So that will be what I am going to go through over here. And this area, these few slides that I have over here, basically is to also help you to make sure that you ask yourself this question, have I really revised through all these areas? So if I revise through, I am more or less well prepared for your coming exam. Okay, so let's take a look first of all. First of all, if you read the question and you say that, okay, the question actually gave me information pertaining to the tax position of companies. When we talk about groups, it's always about companies. So if they give me tax position, it can be prior year position, current year position, or even potential expected future years position. What do I mean by tax position? That means to say they probably give you information like, is it, is it loss making position? Is it a profitable position? So when you are given all the various tax position of companies, maybe even within the whole group itself, all the various company within the group, then usually you should automatically think of the possibility that that specific question itself will cover things like group relief because you're given the tax position. Maybe one of the company is having losses, the other one is having profit. Then you may want to consider group relief. You may even want to consider carry back. If you are given that, my current year is a loss position, but prior year, last year, is actually a profitable position. Then carry back could be a potential possibility. Then of course, the last scenario will always be what? Carry forward. Where possible, we want to utilize all our figures now rather than in the future. But if that, that is not possible, then carrying forward will also help me to achieve future tax savings. So when we come to this topic, we are usually looking at what? Tax savings. If I go for group relay, what kind of tax savings can I achieve? Carry back, what is my tax savings? Carry forward will always be future tax savings. Okay. Then at the same time, if you are given a tax position, not just the losses per se, you may be given things like, okay, I'm going to give you, all right, in a question, let's say capital allowances and losses. So if let's say I have more than one item, okay, in that case, please take note the order of set off. And in the event, if I'm given more than one year, you have to remember we always go by first in, first out basis. Okay. Then next thing is to consider if I read the exam question now and I realize the exam information given to me is actually specific expenditure. They are giving me information pertaining to what kind of expenditure this particular company have incurred or plan to incur. So the expenditure can be in terms of R&D. It can be in terms of capital expenditure or even renovation costs. So what kind of area will we be looking at? It will be quite obvious now if you see expenditure. That will be things relating to or rather rules relating to your deductions and allowances. So just like your R&D, your section 14D, your section 14DA. So what kind of deduction can you be getting? Then capital expenditure, you may be thinking, okay, this capital expenditure, does it relate to plant and machinery? If yes, am I allowed to claim allowances? When we look at things like renovation costs being given to me, then I'll be considering, can I claim section 14Q deduction? So this will be the areas that as you read the question, you see the information, you should automatically think along the line of, okay, this will be the areas that you're probably looking at later on in the requirement. Are you there now? So when you read the question, you must have an idea what is potentially expected. But that, then, next possibility is in group questions, sometimes you're given, or rather many a times, you're going to be given things like, okay, well, this is a whole group position. So when there's a whole group position, we will be looking at maybe they are going to rationalize or streamline the operations of the group. Okay, they're going to streamline the whole the operation itself or they're going to streamline the whole operation of this group itself. Or sometimes they may even tell you they plan to expand the group itself. So what kind of areas or topics will you be looking at when you see information like this? Likelihood, likelihood, it will be transfer of business, transfer of share. Okay, then of course, when you talk about transfer of business, you automatically think along the line of your corporate amalgamation. When you think along the line of your transfer of shares, you will link it to your merger and acquisition. 
So what is probably important for this category of topic will be, number one, you must know the normal tax rule. That means to say, normal transfer of business, transfer of share. What kind of tax implication will you be looking at? Then after which, you will then bring in your corporate amalgamation, assuming it's a qualified amalgamation. Then you will bring in your merger and acquisition. Always remember, corporate amalgamation under the new tax framework. There will be benefits compared to normal tax rule. That's why I say, number one, you must know your normal tax rule first. Okay? Then number two, you bring in corporate amalgamation, you bring in your M&A. So these are schemes whereby I would say that they are always beneficial tax treatment. So that is usually the approach that you have all right, when you think along the line of this kind of category of question. Okay? Then, next area okay, that we're looking at would be if the question is very, very direct. They tell you, this company has applied for or this company has obtained approval for specific incentive. Then very clear cut, the topic itself or the area that we're looking at will be incentive. So the question will usually be very, very precise in terms of what, okay, is this going to be a pioneer incentive? Is it going to be an investment allowance incentive? Is it going to be a GPP, etc.? So they will usually be very precise. So once you see the name of the incentive in the question, you will have no problem knowing what topic is that ready. Okay, then one more area when we always look at incentive is in the event I am one entity, I'm one company over here, and I say, okay, I'm granted certain incentive for certain category of income, but my other non-incentive income, that means to say there is no incentive given, it will still be subject to tax at the normal 17%. So if I have a two category of income, one category is with incentive, maybe the tax rate is 10%, the other category of income is whereby normal tax rate is 17%. In the event, either category of income, you have a loss. The other category, you have a profitable position. Then, when you want to utilize it against the other category of income, remember your section 37B. So, question may not tell you, remember section 37B factor, okay, to apply that. But you must automatically know. Because why? You are my consultant. Always remember that. Okay, then finally for group questions, sometimes when they give you a group structure itself, they may also include companies within the group whereby they are overseas entity. It may be related, sometimes it's not related, it depending on the question. Okay, so every time when you consider the fact that, okay, one of the entity or some of the entity whereby you have overseas entity, so what kind of topics will you be looking at? Potentially, your inward investment, outward investment topic. Okay, so when we talk about inward investment, that means to say, okay, we say that we have someone out there, all right, whereby I am here in Singapore, I have the overseas entity. So we have to consider whether maybe that particular related party itself, will there be any potential PE in Singapore? So usually it will be surrounding around PE concept before we consider the withholding tax concept. Next thing, our investment. So if I say I have overseas entity, it could be a situation whereby I, within the whole group itself, I make an investment out there. So when I have an investment out there, I may be earning foreign income. So what will be the tax implication in Singapore if I were to bring it back into Singapore? Then of course, if you say my overseas entity, we are talking about related party, then don't forget your transfer pricing comes into the picture. Okay, when it comes to transfer pricing, always remember that we support the arm's length principle. And when we talk about arm's length principle itself, remember, despite we say that we adopt the arm's length principle for administrative ease, there are always what we call safe harbor rules in Singapore, such as routine support services. Okay, and your related party loan. So do make sure that you know the treatment, how IRAs will be willing to have certain concessionary treatment or rather safe harbor rules to make sure that, okay, if you follow all this rule, we will take it as all your transactions are at arm's length. Then, transfer pricing, please do not also forget your TP documentation. So you need to know who needs to prepare TP documentation. And of course, at the same time, don't forget that there are also some exemption from TP documentation. Meaning to say, don't really have to keep a full set of TP documentation. 
you know? But please take note, no need to keep PP documentation does not mean no need to all right, charge arm's length price. So always remember that. Then of course, every time when you have overseas entity, that means to say involve another country itself or another, another jurisdiction, then potentially we could be looking at our double tax agreement or what we call the tax treaty. So will there be any DTA itself? If yes, okay, what kind of benefits can you derive out of your DTA? So in actual fact, if you look at this last category where we talk about overseas entity, all right, that means to say, I'm here in Singapore, we have overseas entity, it more or less actually cross over to what I will usually call the cross-border kind of question, okay? So it's similar except that it can also potentially be part of a group question. Okay, so these are the kind of things that you should be looking out for. And when you go back after tonight, okay, you please go through and look at all the potential areas that we have over here. And then you ask yourself this question, okay, have I really gone through a full revision on all this area? If you have, more or less, you are quite well prepared for groups question. Okay, so now you think about it. Group question, I have different kind of information given to me. Different information would mean that this question is going to examine me on a specific area itself, specific topic. So in one question, can I have all of all this area, all this information? Well, potentially possible, okay? Potentially possible, but I don't think it's going to be like 100% everything in just one question. But nevertheless, you have to be prepared. So if I say one question, I'm going to have so much of information given to me, you are going to test me on so many different areas, okay? What is it that I have to prepare myself to really attend this question, to really go through this question, and of course, end of the day, get a pass for that, am I right? Okay, so we say important thing is, when you receive your exam paper, okay, make sure that you read it, and when you read, don't rush to read. Really read and analyze the question. And of course, very important of all, you must understand the question. Okay? So what do you mean by you read, you analyze and understand? You think about it. Most of the time, your exam question, what are they? Paragraph after paragraph. Lines after lines of question. So you read and read and read. You can read 10 times. Okay? But are you able to visualize it in your mind? Okay, the whole scenario given. So sometimes I will say that it is good, okay, a good practice that you actually draw diagram. As you read the question, they give you information, you may want to sketch out your own diagram. It doesn't matter whether you sketch out the diagram vertically, horizontally, in what direction. Doesn't really matter. It's good that you sketch it out for yourself to see the full scenario. Because remember, all questions are scenario based. Okay, so how is it going to work then? Okay, so over here, I am going to give you a simple illustration based on June 2019, question three, Zoro Garments China Limited. So you have done your revision, I won't be surprised that you have gone through this question on your own as well. So what I will do is this particular question, of course, I'm not going to go into the details. So when you look at the paper itself, the question itself, when you read the question, what do you do? Like what I said just now draw diagram, correct? Draw diagram. That is what I think it is better because why I am probably more of a visual person. So when I draw the diagram, I can see things clearly. So how would this diagram, how would the diagram for this question be like that? So let's take a look here. This is the diagram. So when you see a diagram like this, of course, of course this is drawn by me, okay? When you draw it, maybe the diagram will look a little bit different. It doesn't really matter, okay? Key thing is your arrows pointing must be correct. Okay, so let me just run through very, very quickly over here. Sorry, give me a minute. Okay, let me just run through very quickly over here pertaining to this question. If you read the question itself, you realize that this question evolved around this particular company, which is in China, a China entity, ZGCL. Okay, and ZGCL have clients actually, okay, over here. So what kind of, all right, so-called, business are they having with the client they provide service therefore you realize that okay there's an arrow over here there's a service agreement the service agreement is done in china okay then when they have the client itself you realize that what did they actually what kind of service do they provide okay just to give you a little bit of background on this question so we say the kind of service that they provide to your client is they're going to gather information on behalf of their client by getting singapore mystery shopper Okay, to actually go to the shop of their clients in Singapore and gather information pertaining to maybe the quality of the products, the quality of the service. 
And then after that, all the individual mystery shopper will then put in all their results on the website. You then upload the results there. Take note, website is outside Singapore. Are you all there now? Okay, huh? Then, this China entity, when they actually have this business, so-called, we say that that's a business because that's the way they earn their income. Apparently, they have nothing in Singapore. They have no physical business here, no legal entity here, no marketing done here, no delivery here, nothing at all in Singapore. So you realize these are the information that we gather as you read the question. Are you all there now? So if let's say they have nothing here, okay, then you'll always be thinking, okay, so what will be the issue that they're talking about? Overseas entity, when you want to talk about Singapore tax implication, we are always talking about what? PE issue. Always remember, okay, nah? so when you see that, okay, they have nothing here, so will they be having a, will they be considered as having a PE here? So this will be the things that will automatically have to be triggered or on your own. You have to trigger yourself to think about all this. Then at the same time, just to give you a little bit more background of this whole question is the fact that this China entity, when they get their client, they didn't source the clients themselves. Their clients apparently are sourced. If you look at the arrow over here on the screen, they are actually sourced by their Hong Kong based stuff, which is basically from their Hong Kong subsidiary. So they have a Hong Kong subsidiary. Okay, So this Hong Kong subsidiary will source the clients for them. Then the China entity get the Singapore mystery shopper to gather the information and the collation is by the subsidiary again in Hong Kong and then the Hong Kong subsidiary is going to send the report to the clients direct. So now you start to realize that okay all right all information are like jumper up from China you get Singapore set mystery shopper and then your clients are the other category and then you say that okay who's going to collate the result oh my Hong Kong site is going to collate the result. Okay, so you realize that there's involving here, over here, this whole case study, it involved more than one entity itself. It involved more than one country. Are you all there now? Then, of course, they also tell you that because your subsidiary actually provides, okay, you with all these services, help you to collate, help you to get your clients itself, they actually build the China entity. Go there. Then, what else is in Singapore? Because ultimately, you must always remember we are doing Singapore tax here. So we say, okay, what is the part that is in Singapore? We say, okay, I have a Singapore mystery shopper. So when you have a Singapore mystery shopper, before they really go out to kick on the assignment to really be a mystery shopper in your clients, okay, shops or retail shops itself, then we say they need to attend training in Singapore. So I see another portion on Singapore here. But who is doing the training? Is a China entity doing the training? No, they are not. Their Hong Kong subsidiary style is going to be sent to Singapore to do the training. So now you start to see that, okay, I have a few arrows, one coming down, one moving to the left, one moving to the right. So now you think about it yourself. If you are reading the question, paragraph after paragraph, are you able to visualize all these arrows here? Okay, the A do this for B, B do do C, and things like that. So when you see the whole picture this way, Okay, if you are able to read and can visualize automatically in your mind, perfect. Okay, don't need to draw diagram, but maybe I'm not. Okay, I'm more of a visual person. So I draw diagrams so that I am very clear. Okay, the arrow itself, the flow of the information. So from there, then I can really answer the question. Okay, so now if I have read the question itself, I know the full picture here. Remember, it involves how many countries? I have a China side. I have a Hong Kong site and of course here I am, I'm in Singapore. So what happened is, they tell you, Singapore and China, we have a DTA. But then Singapore and Hong Kong, there is no DTA. So that's what, is, that's the, what the information is given to us. Clear already? So once you read the question, okay, I see the full picture already. Then what is the next thing? Next thing is to look at the requirement. Always remember you need to read the requirement before you answer the question. So we say, take a look at this requirement. Everyone, five seconds, read the requirement. Done? Okay, so you read the requirement they are asking basically whether or not the engagement of the mystery shoppers and subcontractors in Singapore, remember the mystery shopper in Singapore, will they result in any Singapore corporate income tax for ZGCL? ZGCL is the 
China entity. So what are they asking? ZGCL, you are in China. When you engage Singapore mystery shoppers okay, in Singapore, will that lead to you having a corporate tax liability in Singapore? Put it simply, do you have to pay tax in Singapore? Okay, so now you think. Okay, here I am talking about a China entity. That means overseas entity. So overseas entity, when would they ever need to actually pay Singapore tax? When they have a PE in Singapore. So that should be automatically the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay, they must have a P in Singapore before we talk about their corporate tax liability. Before we talk about is there any Singapore tax implication. So when we consider that, then you have to know. So what the GCL this entity have in Singapore? Just now we already say. As we read the question, we already draw this diagram, right? We say, oh, they don't have business here. No legal entity. No physical business operation, no activities here. No marketing, no servicing, no delivery done in Singapore. Nothing at all in Singapore. So if they have nothing in Singapore, then what else do I look at? So we simply ask, so how do they earn their income? So they earn their income through their clients, obviously their customers, right? So they actually have service agreement with their customer. So now think, service agreement. Look here in your diagram, it was very clear. Where did you sign your service agreement? In China. All right, in China. Then, not forgetting, where and how do you get your client? Your client, apparently, they are sourced by your Hong Kong-based staff. Okay, you didn't get a client yourself. It was your subsidiary who got it for you. Okay, then, next thing for you to consider is, so where would there be any Singapore tax? That would be here. You engage your Singapore mystery shopper to provide whatever information that your clients want. That's how you earn your income. So by engaging this mystery shopper, would that lead to a PE? Remember, we are always thinking along the line of PE concept, okay? Then don't forget, after the mystery shopper in Singapore already went, all right, to shop already, they are, they are the shopper, they shop, gather whatever information that they want, they upload the results on the website. Where's the website? Outside Singapore. Okay, then after they put up all their results, who is going to collate all the information? Then we say, right at the bottom here, it is a Singapore, the, the, sorry, not Singapore, the Hong Kong subsidiary site who's going to collate the result and sends direct to your client. Are you there? So will that lead to the PE? Simply because you have a Singapore mystery shopper here to do the job. Yes or no? That's for you to explore in your answer. Okay, then don't forget, this Singapore mystery shopper, before they even take on and start the assignment and start to shop, okay, they will have to attend a two-week training. And the training, where is it held? In Singapore. So when you have a training in Singapore, will that lead to a PE? So those are the things that, all right, you are going to consider. All right, these are the things that you're going to consider when you are thinking, will there be any Singapore corporate tax liability? Because we are thinking along the line of what? Do they have a PE? So we explore all this. You see all the ticks over here, right? So you explore all these areas, then you will be able to come to a reasonable conclusion to say it is a yes, it is a no. There's a PE, there will be tax in Singapore. If not, there won't be. Simple as that. Okay, so imagine if you don't draw the diagram, you don't analyze the question, you just look at the whole piece, page, uh, all right, paragraph after paragraph, will you be able to put so many ticks that in your, okay, question paper? If you can, that's fine, okay, but it may be good that you always do a sketch of the whole scenario. Got that already? Okay, now do a quick one, part B. Explain the withholding tax and GST. Take note, now they are very precise. Withholding tax, GST, two different types of implication. If any, arising from the payment of service fee by ZGCL to the mystery shopper. And there is a note there that tells you, you should consider the implication for both ZGCL and the mystery shopper. So, if you read the requirement, okay, I want withholding tax and GSC. So, I come back to my diagram that I've drawn. So, I want these two tax implications. So, they want these two tax implications from whose perspective? Both party perspective. Who are that both party? ZGCL and the Singapore Mystery Shopper. So, now everybody think. When you are thinking along the line, will there be any withholding tax implication? How does withholding tax implication work? There always will be someone in Singapore who is a payer who pay someone outside Singapore called a non-resident. Am I right? Then that's where withholding tax will arise. So you ask yourself in this situation, who pay who? 
who pay who. China entity engage the Singapore mystery shopper. So obviously, the China entity will be paying the Singapore mystery shopper. So now you think, withholding tax means the payer is in Singapore. And the one who received is someone outside Singapore. But in this scenario here, do you realize it is the other way around? The one who paid is in China. Okay, the one who received the income is in Singapore. We call them the Singapore mystery shopper. So you realize that, oh, if that is the case, will that be withholding tax? Obviously, no. Very clear cut case. Very simple. You know the answer straight away. Okay, next thing, GST. When you need to consider your GST implication, always remember GST is a transaction tax. So you look at the transaction. What is a transaction here? Obviously, a service being provided. There's no goods involved here. So who provide who with a service? The Singapore mystery shopper provides the China entity with a service. So the Singapore mystery shopper provides the service. So Singapore mystery shopper is the supplier. That means to say you make a supply. Do you need to charge GST? That's the question. So we need to consider Singapore mystery shopper, do you need to charge? Then on the other hand, because I need to consider ZGCL perspective as well, that's what the requirement asks for. So if I'm ZGCL, then you realize what? I'm the one who received the service from the Singapore mystery shopper, right? So when I receive, if they charge me, then question is, can I claim the input tax? Simple as that. So this will be the implication that you need to put in your answer to part three. Are you all there now? Can I? So sometimes drawing the diagram and then you look at the requirement and then you go back to the diagram itself, it will make things be simpler, okay? All right, so that is the way where I talk about you need to read, you need to analyze, and you need to understand your whole case study. And of course, look at the requirement and look at your diagram again to see which part of this whole case study do I need to consider to put it into my answer. Okay, then that, that will be on groups. So the next area that I have over here will be on individuals. So when it comes to individuals, I will always think, in my opinion, okay, I find that individual questions are much more simpler. Okay, so first of all, let's consider when we talk about questions relating to individual, what kind of information are likely to be provided? And th that with the kind of information, what are the potential topics that should trigger my mind automatically to think, okay, this will be the area, this will be the tax rule I need to put in my answer. So first of all, individual. If I'm given individual, a question whereby the information given in the question is about someone who is employed, then I will say that they will definitely be talking a little bit about taxability. The income, is it taxable or not taxable? Are you given any special concession relating to your employment income? Okay, then of course, double tax agreement. If you're talking about someone who is employed, but this someone, this individual who is employed in Singapore, maybe comes from another country, whereby Singapore and the country, we have a double tax agreement. So that's where we consider our dependent personal services article in the DPA. Okay, so remember, you can get exemption if you satisfy three conditions. Make sure that you remember the three conditions. Okay, so this will be the areas that you'll be looking at if I have someone who is employed. Okay, then if this someone, this individual who is employed, if you are told, given information in one way or the other, and you know that this person is a resident in Singapore, obviously, you're going to consider personal relief claim. Okay, but what if this person is a non-resident? Non-resident, remember we have two rules pertaining to non-resident employee. Number one, 60 days exemption rule. Number two, section 40B, okay? So this will be the rules that you must automatically link your mind to, okay? So that you know that when you answer your question, these will be the things that I'm going to likely to have to put it into my answer because these are all the tax treatment, okay? Next thing, what if I'm given an individual who is employed and this individual who is employed has regional duty, need to fly out of Singapore very, very frequently. So that's where we say, okay, I will be looking at what? Aerial rep status, potentially. NOR, your not ordinarily resident scheme. Then your dual employment. So these are the areas, these are the things that you have learned 
Okay, these are within your syllables itself. So whenever we talk about regional duty, these are the topics, the areas that we are looking at. So you have to consider. Every time given someone who has regional duty, these will be the areas that I can be considering when I do tax planning for them. Always remember, why do tax planning? You are the consultant. Okay, then what if, okay, the question itself didn't give me someone who is employed. They gave me someone who is self-employed. If it's self-employed, we are still talking about what? Income that they earn, is it going to be taxable? But we'll be looking at deduction as well. Because why? Self-employed, you're like having a business, right? So having a business, you're going to have or expenditure that you incur. So there will be deductibility rules for you to consider as well. Then not forgetting, if you're self-employed, you're earning your business, your trade income, then always remember, if you incur capital allowance, incur capital expenditure, relating to let's say plant and machinery most common are computers nowadays then straight away you can claim your allowances so this will be the areas that you need to explore in your answer when you talk about tax treatment okay then once again we say when you talk about self-employed individuals who are self-employed potentially this self-employed people self-employed personnel okay they can be a sole proprietor or a partner so sorry okay so if it is a partner you need to understand that there are two types of partners for tax purposes two types of partner basically a general partner and a limited partner so what's the difference in the tax treatment so make sure that you're aware and you are well versed in the tax treatment in terms of the difference okay then of course what if i have self-employed and i know that this self-employed person is resident in Singapore, then straight away, personal relief claim comes into play again. Okay, what if self employed individuals they are non resident? Then remember, non resident professionals' rules may come into play. So remember the options available for non professional itself two options. 15% of your gross professional income or your 22% of your net professional income. So those are the options available. Then don't forget that DTA again. Okay. So when we talk about your DTA, everybody look here. Employed, you have DTA here. Self-employed, you have a DTA here as well. So this will be, employed will always be your dependent personal services. Okay. Self-employed will be your independent personal services. Got that already? Okay, uh, then next thing will be, okay, if I say I'm given an individual, okay, an individual. So we say individual is self-employed, self-employed. Then what if other than employment income and self-employed income, we talk about the fact that I make investment. So when you look at investment, what are the things that you have to consider, okay, when you talk about tax implication? Invest, you hold, or you divest. What will be the implication when you invest, when you hold, when you divest. Are you all there? Sorry, you give me a minute. I think I received a call from Sylvia. You give me a minute. Hey, hey Yvonne. I think we need to uh, hand over after this slide. Yes, okay. Thank you. And, okay. So over here, okay, so once we talk about your individuals making investment, we are looking at invest, hold, and divest. What will be your tax implication then? Okay, then of course for individuals itself, don't forget you have your trust and your settlement. So when it comes to trust, remember there's only two, in, two tax treatment. Either tax at the trust level at 17%, after which the beneficiary will not be taxed anymore because it's capital in nature. Second treatment will be your tax transparency. That's about it. Settlement. Settlement, there's only one area to look into, anti-avoidance area. Okay, so what are the potential situations whereby we say is that, okay, the anti-avoidance section 31 is going to apply into the scenario given. So these are the things that we need to look into when we look at individuals. Are you all there now? Can I? All right, so this will be the individual category. And with that, now I am, and I'm going to hand over to Ms. Yitlai. Okay, Yitlai, take over from here. All right. Thank you, Yvonne. Good evening, everyone. My name is Yuet Lai. Okay, now let me um, just share my screen with you. 
All right, first of all, I'd like to um, thank ACCA for inviting me for this conference. And um, this evening, what I would like to share with you in the next 20 minutes will be the key challenges for ATX module and how do you go about doing your preparation for the exam and some exam technique. And after which, I will go through you one pass exam question to show you how do we um, go about um, answering that question, the general approach. Now, in the absence of time, um, I would not have um, the opportunity to go through the question in great detail with you. But what I will do is I will show you the general approach, how you could apply the exam technique, which I will go through in a short while in the answering of that pass your exam question. All right, so just to go through the approach in general without going into the detailed answer, yeah? Now, the key challenge for the ATX syllabus is that the syllabus is very lengthy, okay? Meaning to say that the all right, the syllabus covers many areas such as income tax, GST, transfer pricing, including double tax treaty, as well as tax incentive. And ATX is a very content heavy subject, right? Um, there are a lot of rules, regulations that you need to memorize, right? And having understood the technical content, another very important area which many people tend to um, overlook is the ability to connect the various topic that you have learned and see the connection. Now, I will, when I go through the past year exam question with you in a short while, I will show you what I mean by the being able, able to connect the various topic that you have learned, okay? The ATX exam questions are scenario-based questions. So therefore, you will have to be able to apply the technical knowledge that you have learned in the answering of the scenario-based question. So therefore, it is not sufficient for you to just memorize the rules and the condition and regurgitate the them in the exam. That will not do. And finally, time is always not enough for the exam. So time management is a big issue. Yeah. Now, so with these challenges, how would you then go about preparing for your ATX exam? Now, these are some of my suggestions. Get the basic right. Everyone who are taking the ATX paper would have already gone through your basic text courses. You may have taken the F6 syllabus. You may have um, done text in your polytechnic or your university basic text courses. So, Go back to revise the basic text that you have learned. Things like the basic concerning income, expenses, capital allowance, employment benefit. Because the technical knowledge that you're going to learn for the ATX syllabus will build on this basic knowledge that you have acquired. So if you have already returned all this knowledge to your F6 teacher, so please, you know, revise. It will help, okay? And so when you when we touch on ATX, the we will go into more in depth, all right, on the topics, and there will be additional area, new area that uh, will be covering which you have not covered in your F six syllabus. For example, we will touch on transfer pricing. We will touch on double tax agreement. We will go to the in depth discussion concerning permanent establishment issue, and these are the very very important issues. Uh, covering in the ATX syllabus, okay? And again, the ability to see the connection between the various topics, okay? Now, when you prepare for your exam, I would also suggest that um, first step, of course, is to try and understand, okay, the technical concept. Having understood the technical concept, you should then practice pass your exam question. Now, this is the step that you cannot skip because without 
during the past year exam question, you will not be able to tell whether you have fully and truly understand the concept. So by practicing, it's really to test yourself whether you have understood the concept correctly. And after which, and you, of course, you should memorize the content, like memorize the rules and the conditions. Now, the ATX exam format is pretty similar to F6, whereby there are certain information will be provided to you during the exam. Things like the progressive tax rate, personal relief, and for ATX, the stamp duty information will be given to you in the exam. All right. But other than this information, nothing else. So things like withholding tax rate, you will have to memorize. Now, because ATX is such a content heavy subject, so therefore my, my suggestion is that you should study consistently and start memorizing right from the beginning. Don't go and memorize only, you know, one month before the exam, right? Now, this thing concerning rewriting is especially for students who are, um, whom first language is not English, okay? I have come across many students who feedback to me that say that, tell me that, teacher, I have understood the concept, but I have difficulty to articulate the answer, to write out the answer in the exam because of their command of English. Now, so if you have such an issue, then my suggestion is that after you have practiced the past year exam question, then you should practice rewriting the answer so that when you answer the exam question you can you are able to write out the solution the answer in the given time remember time management is a big issue here okay now so not right now i'm quick i will quickly share with you some of the exam technique okay so how you can ace the atx exam i'm sure i'm sure this is what everybody wish to do to ace your exam yeah now, assuming that now you are now in the exam hall, the first thing that I recommend you to do is to read the question, understand the requirement of the question. This is very important because if you answer too much, if you answer beyond what the question requires, you won't get extra marks. You will only be wasting your time. On the other hand, if you did not answer what the question is asking. For example, your answer is incomplete or your answer is avoid, you don't get any marks. So understand the question. And when you read the question, take note of the mark allocation. So basically, you should be guided by the mark allocation. Okay, to what extent your answer must be. Now, some student will ask me, teacher, if the question is five marks, how many pages must I write? Now, it's not about pages, it's about points. Okay, so for instance, in my opinion, if the question has five marks, do you ask yourself, do you have at least five points in the answer? So be guided by the points, be guided by the marks, and make sure that you have the necessary point. Okay, the, because when the examiner marks the exam question, they don't look at how many pages you write. They look at how many points. So you get the point, you get the marks. Yeah? Now, Another important thing is you must understand the case fact given in the question thoroughly. Sometimes the case facts can be very complex. There can be many uh, party involved. So like Yvonne suggested earlier, when you have come across a question like this, it is very useful for you to draw a flow chart. Okay, so draw flow chart to understand the various party involved, which is the payer, which is the recipient which party derive income, which party pay expense. And then from there, you comment on the tax implication on the various party, okay? Later on, when I go through the past year exam question with you, I will, you know, illustrate how to go about doing this, okay? Now, when you write out your exam answer, this is my suggestion you can have a, a general introduction on the subject matter that you're going to discuss. For instance, if the question is testing you on income, okay, then the first paragraph, you can have a general introduction on the scope of income tax in Singapore. 
or if the question is testing you on, let's say, expenses, then you can begin with saying what are the general deduction rule concerning expenses. So just discuss generally first. But after that, you should then discuss based on the case fact. Now, this is something that based on my observation that a student may have difficulty doing it. Sometimes when students answer exam question, they just based on what they have memorized, the conditions and the rule, and they just write down the condition and the rule without making reference to the face case, case fact. So please bear in mind that, for instance, you write down the conditions. Okay, for example, to qualify for foreign income exemption, these are the conditions that you must be, you must satisfy. Now, having mentioned the condition, then you must go on to say that, okay, based on the facts given, are these conditions met by the particular taxpayer in that question. So you have to bring in the case fact to answer the question. So this is something that is lacking, right? When I see, when I mark um, students' uh, scripts, okay? Now, the next suggestion that I would say is, please be organized in your answer. For instance, the exam question may be asking you about GST, income tax and stamp duty implications. So you can organize your answer by giving a subheading, okay? So you may want to start discussing about income tax implication first. So put a subheading income tax, okay? And the income tax implication may affect company A, company B. Then you put a subheading company A, company B. And after which you move on to the GST implication, have a subheading, next paragraph about company A and company B. So when you organize your answer, it, the, it, you, it makes the examiner job very easy. So when he look at your answer, wow, very clear, and he can award the marks very easily. You are helping the examiner to help yourself, okay? When you present a very, very clear and organized answer, okay? And finally, please attempt all the question. The, the least question comprises of 20 marks. So imagine if you did not do that 20 mark question, you know, your um, chances of passing the exam is really at stake, okay? So try and do those questions that you're confident first, finish up those questions and leave the question that you're not so confident to the past, to the last, but don't leave blank because if you leave blanks, you will not have any marks. Write something. Right, write something. You never know what you wrote is relevant and you get some marks from that. Okay, so these are some of my suggestions. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through with you a past year exam question. This uh, past year exam question you may have um, gone through uh, in your own uh, revision. All right, and uh, Now, so assuming that now this is the exam hall, okay? I've gone through with you the, the exam technique. So what, what must you do, okay? So now let me demonstrate and illustrate. For me, now this is something that is very personal, okay? For me, if I am the student, the first thing is I will read the requirement, okay? Because for me, when I read the requirement, I will be able to size up what the question is asking me. So. After I have read the requirement, when I read the case back, I will be able to be more focused, okay? Having known what the question is asking me. And when I read the requirement, I will also take note of the marks allocation, okay? So let's quickly go through the requirement. Discuss the Singapore income tax implications for all the relevant party of the following. A, for each of the payment one, two, and three above made by famous nodal FNPL to Lucky Laksa Corporation LLC under the franchise agreement. And this is 30 marks. Now, so when you read the question, you must be very mindful. Firstly, this question is asking you to comment on the Singapore income tax implication. So there is no GST issue, there is no stamp duty issue, number one. Number two, the question is asking you to discuss the income tax implication for all the relevant party. So in part A of the question, who are the relevant party? FNPL and LL, 
policy. So therefore, you have to discuss the income tax implication from FNPL perspective as well as LLC perspective. Now, there are three payment, okay? And this is this part of the question carry 13 marks, which means to say that you roughly divide out. That means each payment comprises of more or less four marks. Now, do you have four points to, to, to mention about this four payment? Okay, so roughly this is how you should gauge the length of your answer. Okay, this is my personal opinion. Of course, this is plus and minus. There could be more than four, four points. There could be five points or six points, but this is a, a, a rough gauge, a reasonable gauge, all right, on how much you should write. Part B, the salary and allowance borne by FNPL and the reimbursement of expenses by FNPL in respect of two employees of LLC. This question only has three marks. So which means to say that you need to comment the tax implication from FNPL perspective as well as the tax implication from the employee perspective. Okay. And lastly, the sale of two machines from LLC to FNPL, four marks. Now, the question says you are not required to calculate any tax payable. Now, this is a withholding tax question. And the question specifically tell you that you don't have to calculate the withholding tax. Now, if you overlook this note and you go and calculate the question, uh, to, to, you, you went ahead to uh, calculate the withholding tax, you will be just, you know, wasting your time. Okay, it is not required. All right, so please read all the requirement very, very carefully. So after read, having read the requirement, then you go back to the fact of the case. So now when you read the fact of the case, you more or less know what are the requirements and you can be more focused. Okay, so I will very quickly run through the fact of the case without dwelling into too much of detail. Just a quick summary. Now, you have this company called LLC. This is a company that is tax resident in country L. So this is a foreign entity. So this is a so-called a non-resident. Okay, and the questions tell you that this country L does not have any tax treaty with Singapore. And the LLC has established a reputation for the delicious laksa. Right, and just to skip all the uh, nitty gritty, over the years, LLC has expanded rapidly by setting up outlets in the major city in country L. So from this paragraph, we gathered that LLC is a non-resident from country L, and LLC basically carry on business in country L. Now, one thing to take note, the question tells you that country L has no tax treaty with Singapore. Now. Whenever the exam question gives you a certain piece of information, you must be able to click in your mind. Why? Why did the question tell me that there's, there's no tax treaty? How does it affect my answer had there been a tax treaty? So you must be able to think along this line and comment concerning the tax treaty, okay? Which I will go through in a short while, okay? Now, in April uh, 2019, LLC granted an exclusive three-year franchise to FNPL. FNPL is a company incorporated and resident in Singapore. Okay. Now, the franchise agreement provides that LLC is entitled to receive the following payment from FNPL. So, which means to say that LLC is the recipient of the income. LLC derived income, FNPL make the payment, FNPL incur expenses. So when you discuss the income tax implication, you've got to comment whether the income derived by LLC is it taxable. You've got to comment whether the payment, the expenses incurred by FNPL, whether they are deductible. Okay? Now, so these are the three payments. Okay, the first item is a one-off sum of 120000 for traveling to Singapore to advise FNPL on the business matter relating to the establishment of the outlets in Singapore. Okay. Secondly, this is a sum of 60000 payable by monthly installment in return for supplying FNPL with the secret recipe to prepare the laksa. So, so this is... 
sharing secret recipe. Now, when you read this question, okay, you would be a, you must be able to ask yourself, this what what is the nature of this payment? So, for instance, the item one, you must be able to tell that this is the payment for the management of the business, and the payment for the secret recipe, you must be able to tell that this is a payment for know-how royalty, okay. Now, the third payment is concerning a lump sum for traveling to Singapore to demonstrate LLP quality service standard in preparing the laksa and also an instruction manual to set out the training step to prepare the laksa. So again, what is this 50,000 payment for? So basically, is to pay, make a payment uh, by FMPL to LLC for providing service, for providing a training manual. So by reading this, you must be able to tell that this is a show how payment, all right? The payment for uh, services, all right? Show how payment. Now, then the question tells you that the these services are pro provided in Singapore because the staff travel to Singapore to provide the service. So what is the significance for them telling you that the staff travel to Singapore? Okay, if you, if you can recall, there is this exclusion clause under section 12.7 of the Income Tax Act. If the, if the foreigner performs the service outside Singapore, the service fee, the management fee will not be subject to withholding tax. So that is the significance of telling you that the, the non-resident actually performed the service in Singapore. Okay. Now, it is also agreed that LLC was sent two of his employee, okay, from country L to Singapore for 10 weeks, all right? And during this period, FNPL will pay for the salary and allowance of the employee. And at the same time, FNPL will also bear the accommodation, meal and transportation expenses of the employee, okay? So this amount are all borne by FNPL, okay? And finally, uh, in July, LLC sold two of the machine to FNPL, okay, for manufacture. So based on this, now after you have read through the case back, you now reread the question again, and now you'll be more focused. So question A requires you to comment on the Singapore income, income tax implication for each of the payment, one to three, okay? So what you can do is draw a flow chart, simple flow chart like this. So in this case, the LLC is a non-resident receiving the income. So the issue is whether this income is it taxable in Singapore. Okay, and from FNPL perspective, FNPL incur expense. So the issue is whether the expenses are deductible. All right, and on top of that, you must be able to recognize that the payment, the three payment, one, two, and three, these are related to payment that fall under Section 12.7 of the Income Tax Act. All right. So the payment that fall under Section 12.7 of the Income Tax Act, when they fulfill certain conditions, the payment to the non-resident will be deemed to be sourced in Singapore and therefore the non-resident will be subject to withholding tax in Singapore. Okay. But however, you must be aware the obligation to pay the withholding tax to the IRAS is the FNPL. So FNPL will have not only expense deduction issue, will have withholding tax obligation, okay? Withholding tax is borne by the non-resident, but the obligation to pay the withholding tax to the IRAS is the Singapore payer, all right? So when you answer your question, you have to discuss along this line, okay? The income tax implication pertaining to LLC, as in whether the income is Deemed source in Singapore, if that's the case, it will be taxable in Singapore and therefore subject to withholding tax. In which case, you must be able to remember what is the withholding tax rate. Now, earlier on, I mentioned the question tell us that LLC is from a non-treaty country. So now, this is the way you connect. Section 12.7 is the provision under the Singapore Income Tax Act. Now, if LLC is from a tax treaty country, there will be a double tax agreement. 
Okay, so now you must be able to connect the income tax act and the DTA. You must be able to make the connection. You cannot just say, I learned about DTA, I learned about income tax act. But what is the relationship between the two? I don't know. You can't. You must know the relationship. The relationship is this. Under the income tax act, let's say the withholding tax for royalty is to be taxed at 10%. Okay, subject to 10% withholding tax. And if LLC is from a tax treaty country, if the double tax agreement grant a lower withholding tax of 5%, for example, then the double tax agreement will override the Income Tax Act and the lower rate of 5% will prevail. Okay, But for this particular question, because there is no tax treaty um, in country L, therefore, DTA is not relevant. So which means to say that the withholding tax rate will follow that under the Income Tax Act which is 10% for royalty, okay? So this is what I mean by the ability to be able to connect the various topics that you study, okay? You cannot just study the topic in isolation. You must learn to be able to do and see that connection. This is very important, okay? Now, for part B of the question, part B of the question is concerning um, the salary payment by FMPL to the two employees. Now, the question tells us that these two employees are present in Singapore for 10 weeks, okay? So, FMPL, okay, make the payment of salary and allowance to the foreign employee. So, what are the income tax issue? From FMPL perspective, issue is whether the expenses are deductible. From the employee perspective, Employee exercise employment in Singapore for 10 weeks. So therefore, they are deriving Singapore source income. Question, is this employment income taxable in Singapore? So that is the issue. All right. Now, why did the question tell you that the foreign employee worked in Singapore for 10 weeks? Because based on this, you will be able to determine his resident status, that he is a non-resident. And so from here, you must be able to discuss how is a non how is a non-resident employment income being taxed in Singapore? So you have to go on to discuss that. Now, in the absence of time, I am not able to dwell into detail. Okay, so this is the approach. All right, the question asks you to discuss the tax implication of the all the relevant parties. So you must discuss the implication from the employee perspective, from the FNPL perspective. And finally, the part C of the question is concerning the sale of the two machine, okay? So the sale of the two machine, LLC is the seller, LLC sold the machine to FMPL who is the buyer. So the income tax implication, the profit from the sale of the machine, is it taxable in Singapore? Okay, so again, it's talking about taxability. Okay, and the expenses incurred by FMPL, is it deductible? So again, it's about deductibility. Now, the profit for LLC, is it taxable in Singapore? If you go back to the question, LLP basically do not carry on business in Singapore. They carry on business in country L. So therefore, the profit from the sale of the machine is not derived in Singapore. LLC is just basically trading with Singapore. It is not trading in Singapore. So therefore, the profit from the sale of the machine will not be taxable in Singapore. Okay, from, from FNPL perspective, FNPL incur the expense to purchase the machine. So FNPL will be able to claim capital allowance on the acquisition of the machine. So it's, it's very straightforward. So once you get the hang of the flow and the, you understand the question, the, the answer is actually very, very straightforward. Okay, so I hope that my sharing um, is helpful to you. All right, so with that, I have end my segment and now I pass the time back to Sylvia. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you, Viet Lai. Uh, thank you to all the speakers as well. Uh, can we invite all the speakers to turn on your video and then we will move into the Q&A segment. Uh, we have less than five minutes left for this last segment. Can I just check? 
Uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put it under the Q&A tab. Don't be shy. Is it that um, you know all the topic very well already or? <laughs> yeah, so just a few more questions or anything to add on from Yvonne or Yuet Lai or Esther? Um, okay, um, I have one question just quickly to answer. Can I don't answer the question in sequence? Yeah, by all means, if you're very comfortable with doing question two first, then do question two first, but label your question carefully, uh, properly. Then you can move on to question three, question four. Then after that, you come back to do question one. So it's, it's, it's possible. Okay, yeah. Okay, the question raised is, would there be a syllabus change for December 2020 paper? No, for September exam and the December exam paper will be based on the same syllable, same exam cutoff date. Yes, I will be sharing all the slides, okay, through ACCA Sylvia. She'll be sending out all the slides, so not to worry about that. Okay, um, there, I, I see one question. It says, can we write the answer in point form? Okay, now, in my opinion, uh, for question one, definitely a no-no, because question one, there is a four professional marks. You're supposed to write uh, as a professional tax advisor, so you can't write in point form. Okay, four marks will be given to the way you write as a professional. All right. Now, the rest of the question, I would say that you shouldn't write in point form, but you can um, put it in paragraph. You, say, you can say that, okay, there are four, question, four conditions to be fulfilled. Number one, this is the condition, and then you elaborate on the condition. Number two, this is a condition. You can, in my opinion, you can put down the point one, two, three, four, but you should try to articulate your answer in paragraph. Okay. But uh, hopefully, I think the examiner is not so strict, all right? So, but you'll be encouraged to write in um, paragraph form, all right? Okay, I hope I answered that question. Um, okay, I, I see one question. GST is tested for sure, right? All past year paper had the question. Yes, GST is tested for sure. <laughs> okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of whether um, the, the weightage. Sometimes you can have one entire 20 marks question on GST itself. Sometimes the GST question can be uh, together with um, income tax stamp duty implication. So the, it, 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 it's not fixed, but GST for sure will be tested. Okay, so I think with that, uh, again, I think our session is up already. So uh, we'd like to wish all of you who are taking the exams in September or even in December or next year, all the best for your exams. And thank you again to Yvonne, Yuet Lai, and also Esther for helming today's session. And I hope that all the students here have greatly benefited from this session and have a good evening ahead. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.